Stay with me this morning. Here we are again in the book of Ephesians. And we're again in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, last week we took a look at that salvation that Christ gives to us. We looked at salvation itself. And today I suppose we want to look at what that has given to us those of us who are Christian people, what we have been delivered from. And of course, if you are in this place or listening to us on the internet and you know not Christ yet as your personal Savior, then this is a warning uh, as to what life without Christ is and uh, can mean. So we trust that today we will all uh, pay uh, good attention and uh, find something in this uh, to serve Christ in. Let me consider then our verses this morning. Wherefore, as we sing, wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Now a Gentile, of course, is a non-Jew, a non-religious person. If you were not part of the family of Israel, if you were not part of Jacob's children, then you're a Gentile. And, of course, that would be all of us in this room. Uh, And uh, it, according to the Jews themselves, it's not a good place to be in. Remember that being in times past in the flesh, you were called uncircumcision, that, that which is called circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. I want you to underline that part, without Christ. We'll come back to it. Being aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope. You want to underline that? We'll come back to that. And without God. Underline that as well. Without God in this world. But now, in Christ Jesus. Ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that makes the difference. That we want to assure ourselves. But let's take a look at this verse. First of all, it said that we were outcasts. We were Gentiles. By that which is called the circumcision. The circumcised Jew regarded himself as a special favorite of heaven. And he felt that he was superior to all men. He hardly felt himself, in fact, a member of the human family. He was accustomed to speak of himself as the chosen of God. He was chosen, you were not. God loves him, he's not so crazy about you. That was the feeling that the apostles carried with them as well. You remember in the early church, they didn't want to let Gentiles in. It took Peter about seven years before he would preach to a Gentile. And that he had some trouble doing. God had to put him in a trance and give him a vision. And then that began to change things. But very slowly, as Paul continued his preaching and his crusade for the next 30, 40 years, he still had trouble in the church. When you read your epistles, when you read your letters in the New Testament, you find over and over and over again that Paul is having trouble with Jews getting along with Gentiles in the church. And uh, of course, the church members themselves, even today we sort of carry that little fight on. We all feel that we're a little bit superior maybe than to the person sitting in the pew next to us. We're all a little bit superior because we can do this or we can do that. It's easy for those of us in church to misplace Christianity and pick up a little bit of religion. And religion gives us the ability then to look down our nose at somebody because we have something that they don't. We must always remember that we are not religious peoples. People want to throw that term at you all the time. Oh, are you religious? No, I'm not. I'm a Christian. If I were religious, I wouldn't be talking to you because you're below me. But because I'm a Christian, I understand that I am saved by grace. The same thing that can save your soul. That there is no difference. That Christ has torn down this middle wall, as we shall see. He saw himself, the Jew, saw himself as holy and clean. The Gentiles, on the other hand, they were sinners. Remember the Jew who went to the synagogue to pray. Lord, I thank you I'm not like uh, that Gentile over there. 
They viewed us as sinners. In fact, they quite honestly saw you as a dog. To the Jewish mind, Gentiles were lower than dogs. He'd rather have a dog walk into his temple or into, than, than you. Uh, just didn't like us. We were polluted. We were unclean. We were outcasts. We were God abandoned as far as they could see. God chose us. They wanted the world to know. You are an outcast. You, and the worst thing they could think to call you was Gentile. Which had all this connotation in it. Outcast, abandoned by God. The Jew was quite smug. We find ourselves in, in this condition. We are Gentiles. We were Gentiles. God had abandoned us. Because we had abandoned him for our sin. We chose sin over God. We chose to consider in our mind our own way. Our own truth. Our own path. And people today are still busy creating their own path. As though they somehow are smarter than God and had figured this thing out long before he did. Well, I got news for you as we discussed last week. Before the foundation of the world was laid, God laid out the plan of salvation. So I don't care what you're thinking. You aren't thinking anything better than what he thought. There is no plan outside of his. He has declared it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through me. That is the declaration of Jesus Christ who is God the Son. And who should know better than God himself how many paths there are to heaven? God looked around and said, you know, I looked all over heaven and guess what? I'm the only God. Jesus declared, I came from heaven and nobody knows about it except for me. And I'm telling you, I am the way. You must come to the Father through my death, my burial, and my resurrection. Else you will remain an outcast. You will remain abandoned by God. Because God said, this is how I will accept you. The title of our message is Hopeless. Without Jesus Christ, we are outcasts from the very presence of God. That is the definition of hopeless itself. But he compounds this outcast with this. He's not only are you an outcast, but he goes on to say that you were Christless. That at that time you were without Christ. When I was a young man, I received Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Before that time, I was, even though I knew about him, I had a religious upbringing, but I didn't have a Christian upbringing. In my religion, I was told about him, but I didn't tell, wasn't told what he had done for me. I knew Christmas was his birthday. I knew that Easter was the day that he came up from the grave. I knew that Good Friday was the day that he was nailed to the cross. But what did that have to do with me? They were just historical events that I was taught. So did I know of Christ? Yes. Did I know why any of that was done? No, I didn't. But I could tell you his mother's name, his father's name. I could probably name at least 10 of the 12 apostles. <laughs> you know, uh, four of them for sure. But I knew this information, but I didn't know him. And therefore, I was Christless. To know something as a historical fact is different than knowing the person. If all my children knew about me was what they could read on the internet about me, or what they could read in a book if somebody had published the story of my life, that would be far short of them actually knowing their own dad. For years and years and years, 
My dad, I used to tell my wife about my dad, but he was just a story told because I hadn't seen him since I was eight years old. And finally when he, he's 40, and now my wife and I got married when I was about 24. My dad came back into my life when I was 40. So from the time I was 24, she had heard these stories about my dad. And he was just stories on a page. Then one day, he drove up to the front of my house, stepped out of his pickup, and we were both shocked. <laughs> she was shocked at my response to my dad, because my dad had been 36 years old since the day he left. And suddenly, the 72-year-old man, my dad went from 36 to 72 like that. It was hard. My, my brain couldn't get it because I had this whole different dad that I was expecting to come and see. I was expecting the father, actually quite younger than I, because about that time I was 40. So I'm thinking my dad's 40. You know, this picture I had is a man four years younger than me. And when this old man got out of the truck, man, you all of a sudden knew that 30 years had passed by. However, that's, uh, he was just a story to my wife. All of a sudden, he's sitting there in our living room, and those stories all of a sudden became real. She could look at his face, she could look at his hands, she could see everything that I had talked to her about, but now she could see a real person there. She could talk to him and understand and get to really know him. And that's the difference here. We're Christless, we know a little bit, we've heard the story, but you haven't met him. My wife had a different perspective of my father once she met him than what I, the stories that I had given to her. Changed everything uh, about it. And so meeting Jesus Christ personally is a lot different than knowing something about him. It's knowing him. So we were Christless. At that time we were told the promise of a coming deliverer was made to the Jews, not to us. The Jews had the promise of a Messiah. The Jews had the promise of a Redeemer. The Jews had all, we had none. To the world, he offered nothing. To the Jews, he offered this way of salvation, a Redeemer, an opportunity to be bought back. They were instructed when he was going to come, how he was going to come, the place he would be born, the time in which he would. They knew everything about him. What did we know about Christ? Nothing. But the Gentiles, the Jews rather, they knew all this. Yet when he came, they didn't recognize him any better than we did, did they? All that, see, knowledge doesn't do you any good if you don't do something with it. The Jews knew the town he would be born in. Yet when the wise men came, Nobody knew why they were there. And then when Jesus was baptized, nobody understood what he was there do what he was doing there either. Hey, let us, he had to say to the crowd, let us fulfill all righteousness. When he was crucified, they argued, well, listen, this can't be the Christ because he comes from Nazareth and the real Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. They didn't even know that. How come they didn't know that? Having information is only useful if you use it. They had information about Christ, but they didn't bother to know the man. They just wanted him to get rid of the Romans. They just, they wanted a king who would drive the Romans out. They didn't want a king that they would serve. They wanted a king that would drive the Romans out for them and declare them independent again. So when Jesus came and offered them salvation what do I need that for they didn't understand the need of their own Messiah yet alone how could we have possibly since it was never even told to us I'm so grateful for the Apostle Paul who was declared to be the Apostle to the Gentiles and it was his mission to come out and to tell us these things that nobody would bother to share with us Peter said tell you what you go to the Gentiles I'll stick here with our people I'll go tell the Jews throughout the world. You can go ahead and tell a couple of Gentiles if you would like. Kind of strange, isn't it? This one, though, hopeless. 
To be Christless is to be hopeless. To be hopeless in this case then, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promises, having no hope. You know, hope has to be based on something though. Without a promise, you're cut off from any knowledge. And without knowledge, what do you have hope in? Or what can you hope in? Being a couple of sailors here, if you put us in the middle of the Pacific or in the middle of the Atlantic, without a chart, without a compass, without any direction, you don't know which way you're going. How could I find where I need to get unless I know where I am? Whenever you start a journey, the first thing you got to do is know where you are. If you were to drive the freeways and somebody was to take down every single sign on every single road everywhere so that you didn't know if you were traveling north or south, east or west, no road signs whatsoever, what hope would you have of getting anywhere? Particularly if you were to, maybe you wake up and you're in the middle of the country. And you don't know where you got, or you don't know how you got there, you don't know where you are, you don't know which direction you're facing, and then how are you going to find your way back home? You have to have something that gives you direction. You need to have a compass. You need to have a chart. And in the Navy, you have to have an anchor. You start getting too close to that shoreline, them jagged rocks will tear you apart. You have to have an anchor. So that you can cast that into the sea and keep yourselves away from especially at night, away from those rocks until it is more safe to navigate it in the daylight. So here we are then without hope. We have no compass in this life. We have no guide in that. We have no guide posts. We have nothing to say that this is that way and this is that way. We don't know where we are. and We don't know where we are going. That's hopelessness. To not know where, if you were to suddenly wake up and in maybe a state of amnesia and not know who you are, that's hopeless. Without a direction, without something to say, go that away, you got no direction. At sea, everything looks pretty much the same. Got to tell you. When you're out in the middle of the Pacific, there ain't nothing to get your bearings on. You got one wave after another and they all change. It's like, wait, follow that wave. Wait, on second thought, you're just going to float around out there. Fortunately for us, with the advent of satellites and everything else, our captains always knew where they were going. It's even harder. My poor friend here in the submarine, he can't even see where he's going. You got to rely on something. You've got to rely on some kind of device that tells you where you came from and where you're going. Otherwise, you can have no hope. Let me consider these ways with you for just a moment. First of all, let us consider then that hope is not simply expectation. See, we expect many things that we do not hope for. For example, in the natural course of things, I expect difficulties. I don't hope for them. I expect opposition. I expect misrepresentation. I expect to get old. None of those things am I hoping for. I'm expecting aches and pains. Not saying, oh, I hope I get aches. See, expectation is not the same as hope. In this world, people may have expectation, but that doesn't mean that they have hope. Expectation is not hope. We expect affliction. We expect suffering. We expect infirmities. We expect disabilities and old age. I got to say, none of these I'm fond of. I do not get up in the morning and say, oh, please give me some troubles today. I hope I have a bunch of... Now, I understand I might. I expect that my days are filled with difficulties. As a man, as the sparks fly upward, a man is born to adversity. I accept that. I am not hoping for it. So expectation is not 
hope and hope is not simply expectation hope is not simply desire our desires are as thick and plentiful as apple blossoms few of which ever ripen into the promise given we desire uninterrupted health we desire wealth and some churches will tell you that's what you're gonna get you're gonna never be sick you're gonna all be rich and you look out in the parking lot and the only guy with the fancy car is the preacher <laughs> right? and most dangerous and most disappointing of all the human wishes we desire pleasure we want to be happy we want success in this life And the realization of the most ambitious of our dreams. That's what we want. But we have no reasonable ground for hoping that all those desires will be attained. I might hope when I leave here to find a brand new car waiting in my driveway. I might hope for that. But what reality do I have to expect that? I might expect that when I look in the mirror, I'll be 30 years old again. I might hope for that. I might desire. But what reasonable expectation do I have of that being true? And yet people expect heaven to be theirs. People hope and desire but they have no reasonable expectation, no expectation. Outside of Jesus Christ, why would I ever expect heaven to be mine? See, hope is the expectation of the desirable. It must, however, have a foundation which the expectation rests upon. There must be an object by which that desire might rise. Now, I hope for heaven, but it isn't based on anything that I have done. My hope is reasonable because this man, Jesus Christ, who died on that cross, who was buried and three days later conquered death in the grave, came back from the dead. He said, I have laid my life down and I have picked it up again. Look at the miracles which I have done. Do they not testify of who I am? And the greatest one was laying down my own life, staying dead for those three days, and then picking up my own life. This proves that I am God, and therefore I have the right to promise you life everlasting. And since the conqueror of death itself says to me, I can also overcome death for you, well, what expectation is that? It's sure he said that. Ah, but was not there the story of Lazarus? Was not Lazarus laid in the grave? Was he not in the grave for four days when our Savior came there and said, Lazarus, come forth? And did not Lazarus rise from the dead? Did he not come forth? Did not Jesus say, I am the resurrection and the life? He that believes in me, though he is dead, yet he shall live. Is there now not some reason for me to hope? Is there not some knowledge upon which I might base this hope? See, God never asks you to believe anything until he first gives you something to believe in. It is not blind faith that I follow. Jesus Christ said, look at the miracles that I have performed. Do they not speak of deity? Did I not say that I came from heaven, that I am going back again? I'll tell you what, in, you could take this life and in three days I'll raise it up again. That will prove to you who I am. And sure enough, they lit, took his life. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They thought this was the end. They thought this was the extinction of Jesus Christ. But it was only the beginning of his new life and mine. So my hope, my expectation of the desirable thing, my hope and expectation of heaven itself is not based 
hopelessly. It is not based without knowledge and without fact. It is based on a promise made by one who proved he could guarantee, who proved that he could do what he said he could do and that he did it. The foundation of hope, of course, is Jesus Christ. And the object of hope is to live with him in eternal glory. That was his promise. That we should live forever with him. That we should be taken to the home of the Father. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I tell you this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and he did. And if I go and repair, prepare a place, I will come again. He promised to come the first time. I know he's coming the second time. This is my proof. This cross, this empty tomb where he once laid is the evidence that I have. This is the knowledge that I hold so dear. These things are written, this death, this burial, this resurrection, all these miracles, these things are written that you might know you have eternal life and that this life is in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hope is the balloon of the soul. Soaring majestically toward heaven. We scan the scene of beauty and grandeur, never behold by earthbound senses, but suddenly we realize that heaven is a real place and a real reality and possible for us. I can get there. The stories given, the pictures painted throughout this book of the golden streets and the glories of heaven, I realize now are mine and they are mine because of what he has done. He conquered hell and the grave itself. That they might never hold me. That I might pass beyond this pale. But there is a reminder to us that a false hope really is no hope at all. It rests on no solid foundation. If I hope in myself, what hope is that? Can, can I overcome death itself? In my own strength and power. Nobody ever has. No man but one has ever come back from death and said, here am I. On his own power. Lazarus came back, but that was on the power of Jesus Christ. But no man of his own power has ever been able to break through death itself. So what hope do I have? that I could cross that barrier. It's not justified by any sound reasoning whatsoever, is it? It is but the blue light of a frantic conjecture generated amid the restless tumult of the soul in the large stage of despair. Apart from Jesus Christ, I'm an outcast. Without Christ, I am Christless. How can I, without holding Christ, how can I not be Christless? He is the Christ. In order to not be Christless, I must have the Christ. In order to have hope, I must have that which he promised. That I might have any reasonable hope at all is only in him. He is the hope. He is the way. He is the life. 